it's hard to believe that you published Future Shock uh, over 35 uh, years ago. I mean, reflecting back now, what are the predictions in that book that you're proudest of, and which ones continue to kind of haunt mm -hmm. you yeah, a bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the central thesis of that book, the main idea, uh, which was basically new at the time, was that, look, change is going to accelerate. Mm -hmm. Life is going to be faster. We move, the, the pace of everything is speeding up. And that will have Im, uh, impact on family life, on friendships, on products, on companies, and even on geopolitics, everything. We forecast uh, ele electronic video recording. It didn't exist at the time. We forecast sat satellite te uh, television would be mm -hmm. a big deal. Everybody said it wouldn't at that time. Uh, we, s we forecast changes in the family structure, that the nuclear family would no longer be the dominant form of family. And it's only 25% of the po population in the US today lives in the nuclear family format. Um, so we, w we, we, we forecast a lot of things that just came out exactly, more or less, as we, as we told it. Um, what we got wrong <laughs> are usually some examples. But the most important one, I think, was, had to do with cloning. We f in 1970, when that book came out, we forecast that we would clone animals. We also said we'll clone humans, and I think we still will. Mm -hmm. Somebody will. We may not want it. It's an ethical issue now more it's than a scientific one. It's a big moral, one, moral yes. issue, of course, uh, and a very dangerous one. But somebody's going to do it, in, yeah. in my judgment. Uh, and I'm always teased about uh, uh, paper clothing. We said that uh, th things are becoming more and more temporary. We may wind up using throwaway paper clothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody says, well, we don't. And that's true, more or less. But I happen to carry with me, ever since those days, uh, a little plastic wrapped pair of paper underwear, just to prove that it did exist. <laughs> yeah, there, there it is. Now, 10 years after, after that, yeah. you, you published The Third Wave. Right. And, and by your own admission, you think this is probably the most influential work uh, yes. that, that you did. And it still bears very, very much on, yes. on the, the current research yes. that, uh, that, that you're doing. Again, revisit that for our, our audience in terms of what the, the, the major theme was. What, what we said there was that you could divide history into three great waves of change. The first was the, the change from hunting and gathering, truly basic existence, to agrarian, peasant agrarian uh -huh. economies, which covered the world and lasted about 10,000 years as the dominant form of human existence. And then came, starting roughly in the mid-1600s with the Enlightenment and, and, and the experiments with the steam engine and so forth, then came the, the rise of industrialism, factory life, mass production, cities, urbanization, uh, a shift in the family from uh, multi-generational households uh, to smaller households and nuclear family and so forth and so on. So many, many changes came with, with what we call the second wave of change. Uh, and then starting after that came the third wave, or what we call the third wave, and that is the transformation we're living through still, started quite a long ago, but we're still living through this transformation to a new kind of economy uh, uh, based increasingly on the substitution of knowledge for muscles. And this is having an effect all over the world and is also happening at great speed, but it began a lot longer ago than most people uh, knew at the time. Now, you, uh, I was interested to find out, because I wasn't around at the mm -hmm. time, that you, it, you worked in collaboration with TV Ontario yes. Uh, yes. On, on the third yes, wave. Yes, we made and, a, and, we, and that had a big influence yes, in breaking these ideas around the world. Uh, yeah, it did. We, we spent a, a long time. I think the project probably took two years overall. Uh, and we did a 90-minute uh, uh, special based on the book The Third Wave. It's called, it was called The Third Wave. We shot in 75 locations and in nine, I think, nine countries and so forth. And so forth. I understand that the, the series had a great effect in China in particular. Yeah, it had. Um, what happened was the book, The Third Wave, was published in about 3,000 copies for top senior communist leadership, just the top. You weren't allowed to see it otherwise. It was immediately attacked as, quote, Western spiritual pollution, which was the phrase the Chinese, the communists sure, sure. used. Um, and it was taken down, taken out of the stores. There then followed six months of intense debate inside the Chinese Politburo about what to do with this book. And in October of 1983, <coughs> the then Prime Minister, Zhou Ziyan, uh, said, we must study the third wave. At which point, people were still afraid. So they went to the chairman of the party, the one person higher than the Prime Minister, right. and said, 
uh, what do you think? And he said, too many people in the party are afraid of new ideas. At which point the printing presses began to roll all over China. There were regional editions, school editions, uh, etc. And, and uh, they indeed did show that not only did, the, did, did they show the television program uh, in our presence when we were at an event, but they then you know, made copies of it and, so, and got, it all, so got it all over the country. People come to us today and say, I bicycled 10 miles to see that program. I want to talk more about China today, uh, but, yeah. but first, in your, in your new new book, I mean, you you tell us that we are now experiencing uh, revolutionary wealth right. as part of the continuing evolution of the, the the third wave. Explain that concept to me and okay. and, and the viewers. Okay, um, what's happening uh, today, I believe, is a is a profound transformation, which uh, of the of of wealth and the way we make wealth, and it is going to knock the props out from under conventional economics. There's a big chunk of the book that deals with what we call prosuming. And that's a word we made up and first used in the third wave uh -huh. in 1980 uh, uh, to, to combine production and consumption. The same, you, you, it, it, all of our ancestors, all of us are prosumers, by the way, but uh, all of our ancestors uh, led, uh, lived in worlds at one time in which there was no such thing as money. And there was no such thing as going down the supermarket and getting your food. You had, to, you had to grow it. Most of human history, most everybody, was a prosumer. Sure. Only late, in, relatively late in human history, did somebody invent money and exchange and trade and all of the, the um, things that come with that. So what, we, uh, what, what has happened is, at least since the 1600s, uh, we have had uh, brilliant economists, brilliant, brilliant people, uh, who have studied how an industrial uh, system operates, but they have focused entirely on money and how money changes hands and how it is invested and how it is, how it is, uh, you know, prices. And they've, and they've been remarkably intelligent about all of this, although they fail with forecasts very, very often. But they have virtually ignored the fact that there are, that we are still pursuing, and not only still pursuing, but pursuing more and more and more that we're back in the prosumer business. Give us an example creating, of that again. Yeah, uh, what, we're doing, what we're doing is creating, uh, is there, there's a, a money economy that we operate in, you do, I do, everybody in this room does, uh, but there's also a non-money economy. For example, uh, people volunteer. That has an impact on the money economy, but it's never, or seldom if ever, mm -hmm. recognized, mm -hmm. let alone measured. Uh, more recently, sitting in some tiny little cubbyhole, I suspect, in a tiny little country called Finland is a guy, a young uh, computer programmer who's working for, I forget, I think it's a, it was an agency, a government agency of some kind or an international agency of some kind, and he didn't like the software. He felt that it was inefficient and it was cumbersome. So uh, without money, without, uh, I suppose, even asking anybody, as a hobby, he said, I can do better than that. And he began Better to write... Better than Microsoft, basically, what he was saying. Well, wasn't he? <laughs> that's what it turned out to be. Yeah. He then takes that and puts the source code for that out on the web. Suddenly, a thousand programmers all over the world pick up on that and begin at tweaking it, adding to it, subtracting, making it better, more effective. And now you have Linux. Uh -huh. And Linux is a software, uh, operate, is an operating system that has Microsoft trembling in its boots. So somebody doing work without pay has had a big impact on a key industry. Not only is it Microsoft, um, China, for example, has re requires government agencies to use Linux rather than Microsoft. And, 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 and in the meantime, they're enjoying uh, uh, putting Microsoft down and giving the United States the finger. <laughs> but but the, point, the point here is that we do many, many different things, from high-tech things to very low-tech things. How about how about the work we do when we cook our own meal? If we, if we, had the, if we called a restaurant and had that meal brought into the house, mm -hmm. that becomes part of the gross national product. That's measured. We know how much that is. But if we cook it ourselves, the labor that we put into that 
is not is zero right in terms of our GDP. So so GDP we in, in revolutionary wealth we call it grossly distorted product. <laughs> now we've known for some time that there's a non-money economy. Right. The, the things you talked about in terms of volunteerism and right. uh, and, and home cooking. The, the technological side, the knowledge base side, right. though, is is fascinating. You have Linux, right. you have Wikipedia, yeah, yeah. which is remarkable yeah. <laughs> dictionary that yeah. made by right. average. Joe's. Right, and, uh, and, and is just as accurate, apparently, as the Encyclopedia Britannica. MySpace, which is sold yeah. for 500 The question is, is, is that given the contribution to wealth and given our, our frame of reference continues to be money, yeah. can you monetize the non-money well, that side is, of Well, that's of a question. Economy? That's a legitimate question that comes up all the time. There are ways that we could, in okay. fact, m measure this phenomenon uh, uh, which would radically change our economy. Uh, the, there are, the, the, the data is not good, as I said, because the economists haven't collected it. But uh, at least one estimate holds that, that the amount of actual data, uh, actual wealth that is created by people working without pay on their own is equal to the entire paid economy. Now, the other thing I hadn't really thought about at all as part of this trend of prosuming mm -hmm. is that businesses are actually encouraging this because what they're getting the consumers to do is yeah. to do work yeah. on their behalf right. that they don't get paid exactly. for. Exactly. This is what you call the third job. Yes. Give us some examples yeah. of what this yeah. what we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody anybody who's watching this program or who has used an ATM machine uh, or has done any number of other uh, other things book flights on the internet has probably without thinking about it been performing a job that some company wanted you to perform. Uh, because it would save them money and they didn't have to employ as many people. And the, and the answer to that, uh, the example of that that just really knocks you out, is the ATM machine. The amount of uh, transactions now done with the ATM machine was the equivalent of full-time work for 200,000 tellers. What we say is the, um, you, you, when you, get, you go out, you work for pay, that's your first job. Right. You come home, you wash the clothes, you take care of the kids, you clean the kitchen, that's all your, of those that's things. Your that's job. your non money second job. And now you're punching in all this data for somebody else. That's your third job. This you call desynchronization. Yeah. Is so, part of it? so what we say is that certain changes are moving so rapidly that they're leaving others behind. So what you see is uh, biz the business community, for example, and this, this goes for Canada as well as the United States and other countries, businesses are changing very rapidly because they're under tremendous competitive pressure. You don't change, you die. You get wiped out. So the change is extreme, the pace of change is extremely rapid. Uh, what's happening not fast, uh, a lot of things, do you see much change in labor unions, mm -hmm. aside from losing numbers? This is the implosion you talk this, about. This is, this is existing bureaucracies and institutions. Existing institutions. Uh, or how quickly is our education system, right. public education changing? You're particularly hard on the education yes, system. Uh, yes, we are. And, and can you have a, an economy and a, and a business sector operating at 100 miles an hour and schools operating at 10 miles an hour and not operating very uh, intelligently about preparing people for the real world that's going to exist. They're still preparing kids for factory jobs that won't be there. So, uh, so what you have within, this, within the structure of Canadian society and American and elsewhere are different institutions changing at different rates of speed. That creates enormous complexity uh, and uncertainty in the society and the, break, the potential breakdown of, uh, of many of these institutions. A little bit unfair uh, because, you know, as you say, you're a, you're a writer, not a clairvoyant. Mm -hmm. But is there a fourth way? Do you see anything out there that suggests well, uh, yeah. uh, that a next huge transformation? Well, clearly, one thing that's happening uh, that, that will have enormous implications is the convergence of, of information technology and bio, uh, uh, biology, plus coming down the line, nanotechnology, mm -hmm. all of these. But the thing to look for are not the e these individual uh, fields, but their convergences, how each one pushes the other ahead. And finally, uh, uh, and it's, it's a good way to wind up here, what will people remember about this moment of history a thousand years from now? They're not going to remember the, the, any of these details we've been talking about. They will remember one thing about this era. This is the first time in human history that people have created wealth 12,000 or more miles off the planet in space. Mm -hmm. Every time you use an ATM, every time you watch television, every time you use a, a, a telecommunication, you're relying on something that's not, no longer on our planet. 
And I believe that we're going to see the heavens filled with satellites the size of your credit card or smaller. And that we're going to be generating enormous amounts of wealth by being able to do that.